What's up everybody? Was Goody and thank you very much for tuning in to a brand new video. And today, as you guys have noticed in our past couple videos that have been released on the channel, we've been going over everything BlizzCon 2016. As you guys know, I used to play Blizzard games on my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel did take a switch in 2016. All of my Blizzard gaming videos were removed on the channel, and the reason being is I wanted to start anew. But we are getting back into Blizzard gaming, and the reason being is I already had that planned, I just needed to get through this final semester of school, and I wanted my channel to be basically brand new in the summer of 2016, which was past, and so we're going to be starting up fresh when it comes to Blizzard gaming. StarCraft, one of the very originals of uh, Blizzard gaming. My brother, who is uh, just it's over 30 now, um, he used to play this game, Back in the day, I had no clue what it was until I got into World of Warcraft and started playing StarCraft myself. StarCraft's an amazing game, and we are going to be going over what they have been released uh, content-wise into the game uh, from BlizzCon 2016. So as always, let's go ahead and start off with a cinematic and uh, dive on into the details on what we have just witnessed. So, Co-op Commander Preview from Alexei Suvok. So, uh, Suko, my bad. You pronounced that wrong, son. Let's go ahead and check it out. Loves, I love Blizzard cinematics. So we got Sukhov here. I still know a thing or two about leading an army. Infested units and structures. Oh, we've got a new gameplay mode already. My forces are Game has changed so much since StarCraft 1, son. But effective. The originals in the 90s. Infect your enemies. Our opponents like a basic understanding Scourge going strategy. ham over here, sir? I will send my forces to establish control. Yeah. Unleash the horde. Think of World of Warcraft horde? No, I'm joking. That horde. Have that horde, son. Idea how many infested there are? The infiltration, man. My army might be monsters, but that is what makes us strong. Starcraft. Oh my gosh, dude. I love- They give- they give you chills. Watching Blizzard cinematics, man. They give you goddamn chills. Now let's go ahead and check it up with the BlizzCon recap for StarCraft 2 multiplayer. Flanked by 10 foot tall statues of Raynor and Kerrigan. The panel stage in Hall A buzzed with excitement as onlookers took their seats. The distance echoed of the World Championship Series carried over from the nearby hall as thank you, as Ty and Pyun concluded the third series of BlizzCon's initial day. So all more attendees, as more attendees took their seats, three members of the StarCraft II design team, David Kim, uh, oh, and I got his autograph on one of my shirts, by the way, from uh, Blizz, uh, couple, uh, last BlizzCon, Aaron Kirkpatrick, as well as Michael Scapion. Uh, you think, okay, the only one I don't have is Aaron, but I got the other two's actual autographs on not only my shirt, my for the one Itachi shirt, I got it on a poster of StarCraft as well. Took to the stage. They began the panel by discussing the designer-community relationship. Community collaboration has been a critical part of the StarCraft II design process for nearly two years, and Kim outlined in detail how much the design team has benefited from sourcing the opinions and perspectiveness of the game's uniquely passionate community. Kim went on to address the main goal for StarCraft II design team, to promote mastery through stability. By working with the community, they've been able to explore the current states of Legacy of the Void and then work on developing a major patch to improve the game. The major patch includes several complete and unit redesigns, and numerous balance changes for each of the three races. First up at the panel was Terran. So let's go ahead and check it out what they have to do with Terran. The most impactful changes currently in the patch arguably apply to Terran. The entire mechanical tech branch is being redesigned to function differently. The pre-patch mech is often a disadvantageous tech choice in the higher skill levels of multiplayer. I've noticed that. Goddamn improvements to units such as the Siege Tank and the Cyclone aim to change that. The panel focused on these two units since they're meant to serve as a central part of what new mech is all about. Mech, the Siege Tank and Cyclone. So if you've ever tried to hold a specific area as mech, you've probably noticed that it's a 
penless endeavor. That mobility of met through cyclone kiting, millions, and medevac lifted siege tanks was a tool that was required to be leveraged as mech was to be used to its full potential. As such, mechanical armies did not always stay in one place for too long. S my bad. Uh, Scipion emphasized the importance of zone control in a mech composition then went into display video clips of units that will be adjusted accordingly. The siege tank, uh, for example, was shown without the ability to transport while siege. Similarly, the cyclone has become less of a kiting unit and more of a frontline fighter. And while these changes might seem like net loss for the unit's performance, both saw massive boosts of their damage output. The Cyclone, for instance, will now function as a rapid-fire uh, unit, rapid unit anti-armor damage dealer with general higher damage than before, while the Siege Tank will see its damage while sieged drastically increase. These damage increases versus armor units are meant in part to uh, make mech a more viable composition against Protoss. General changes. In addition to the dramatic redesigns of the Siege Tank and Cyclone, numerous other Terran changes were discussed. The team reviewed the new battle cruiser, which now re relies on cooldowns rather than energy to cast its abilities, and also mentioned that the Thor will now will be more powerful versus air units due to the upcoming changes of those units. Next up, we've got Protoss. The discussion then moved on to Protoss as a battle between a Terran mech army and several Tempests were shown on screen. The Tempests had drastically reduced anti-ground range, but were equipped with a new ability that paralyzed units in small areas, allowing the rest of the Protoss army to move in and eliminate the Terran force. A slide that appeared up on the screen, flanking the sides of the stage, gateway units, harassment units, and air units. These were the focus areas for Protoss in the major patch. To give an example of the changes in action, the panel played a video of Dark Templar despite seeing substantial plays in the earlier game. The Dark Templar unit largely falls off in usefulness as game carries on. The team explained that they're hoping to bring balance the Protoss harassment options by ner uh, nerfing adepts and warp prisms while giving more late game utility to the Dark Templar through the addition of Shadow Stride, a short range teleport ability similar to Blink. This ability requires an expensive research upgrade, however, so it's not expected to heavily impact Dark Templar rush strategies. After the Dark Templar, the panel moved on to the carrier. Scipion uh, highlighted how the carrier is a very interesting unit when it is given micro attention. Some changes are being made to incentivize players to micro carriers more often as a result. The set and forget ability release interceptors is being removed and is be it's being replaced by interceptors are being cut to a fifth of their current cost, 5 minerals versus 25 minerals, and will be initially set to autocast for the carrier. The aim here is to provide a greater reward for players who are skilled in keeping carriers alive. Next up is Zerg, my favorite of the three by the way. After a swarm of interceptors finished killing a Zerg, Based on screen, a massive hydralis stood forth the audience. Venice's unit named were displayed on stage. But hydralis was followed by the phrase as a core unit. Zerg, hydralis as a core unit, baneling, infestors, burrow, casting, and swarm host. 
In preparation for joining the other Core Zero units, the Hydralis is getting a massive buff. First, the unit is receiving a flat plus one increase to its range, increasing its combat capability dramatically. And when a player uh, completes the Hydralis unit muscular augment upgrade, and unit will receive a plus 10% greater speed boost on creep, giving it much more defensive utility versus drops and harassment. The intent behind the changes is to make the Hydralis as viable of a tech uh, commitment as to more common options like Mutilis as well as uh, Roach and Ravagers. After the Hydralis, <coughs> Scipione displayed the new Infester and its Burrow casting capabilities, which will serve to make mobile deduc deductions a more important component to have versus Zerg. The new Swarm host was also displayed. Its cost to greatly decrease and its Locust will have a greater swoop range. The Locust damage is decreased as well, but the newer, less expensive Swarm host should now be more viable. Harassment took overall. Next up, we got the exploratory changes discussion. After covering each of the changes that would be coming to the game, they uh, briefly covered the topic of adding new units. This was something the team explored in great depth, but ultimately rejected for the time being. The team strongly considered adding the Goliath to competitive uh, multiplayer, for instance, and uh, iterated on multiple versions of the unit. Mech does have some areas of weakness in its current state, which would make adding the Goliath seem like a viable option. But for the tech path, already has uh, under underused uh, units that are being adjusted to fill these gaps. As such, if it was determined that we could come up with a version of the Goliath that didn't overlap significantly with other units or take away from the new zo uh, zone control approach, they're going to be taken into compensation. To show an example of how new units are considered, Aaron talked about a Zerg unit that would be considered by the design team. In their consideration, the design team ended up re referencing an old ideolo ideology which had guided them in the original devs of StarCraft II's development, the so-called 15-unit max rule. With the quantity here ended up becoming more of a symbol than a specific number, this rule was established to encourage the design team to keep the unit count to a minimum instead of focus on adding depth to and complexity in other ways. Due to the existing quantity and diversity of zero units, the team found that it was difficult to come up with a new unit that wouldn't overlap uh, with the new functions of existing units. As such, they felt it was best to leave the game's unit count as is, unless there's a significant reason to change it. The War Chess. They're introducing a new way to support StarCraft II esports while also giving you access to all new in-game goodies. They call it the War Chess. It's a virtual treasure map that you'll have the option to purchase, uh, allowing you to earn New and game rewards, content and content by playing your favorite StarCraft II game modes. The more you play, the more rewards you'll earn. The War Chest will have uh, its own seasons and with new. So it sounds kind of like uh, Rocket League here, and with new content to earn each time. The cur we cur they currently plan on having two seasons a, a a year. Sorry about that. With each season tied to major esport events. You'll also be supporting esports because a portion of the proceeds of each purchase goes directly into supporting global esports initiatives. What kind of goodies do you expect to unlock? They'll have new faction specific skins to each races, the Brutal Tardarim, Primal Zero, and the Terran Mercenaries, for example. They also have plans on releasing new digital comics with uh, each new War Chess season. The three comics will involve uh, each of the races, and you'll be able to read them directly within StarCraft II. 
New Command Console skins will also be offered as reward. The War Chest is still in early progress and development, and they'll have more details coming up pretty soon in 2017. Nova Covert Ops Mission Pack 3. They're preparing to release the final chapter of the Nova Covert Ops Mission Pack. At the end of the second chapter, the mastermind behind the Defenders uh, of Man was revealed. Nova must act quickly to bring the conspiracy to fall halt at once and for all. Along with the release of the final chapter, they'll deploy all of the covert op assets to uh, the editor so the amazing arcade community will have even more tools to the disposal. They look forward to seeing these uh, once Mission Pack 3 goes live. And finally, they'll be releasing a brand new comic featuring the most powerful ghost of the Dominion, Nova, the Keep is set to during early release uh, early years of Varian's uh, Valerian Manget's reign. Shortly after the event of the Legacy of the Void, the story will also have a strong connection to the Mission Pack 3, so don't miss out. So basically what was released for StarCraft 2 were uh, co-op mission updates and a couple of more uh, updates to the gameplay itself, but other than that, not too much for StarCraft. Uh, but I just want to say for those of you that tuned in, thank you very much for tuning in. Got any questions, post down below, and stay tuned for more. Peace out, everybody.